Please join me in welcoming Dr. Timmy. Good evening, everyone. Needless to say, it is a joy to be back here. It was as a Jesuit volunteer in Tamina and then in Fairbanks that I really confirmed my commitment to be a person who was going to live and to share the gospel. At that time, we didn't quite have that language, but I knew that I wanted to serve the church. I think the other thing I love to say about my experience in Tamina was that I came in second place in the spring dog mushing competition. <laughs> and say, so it was the division for new white people that had lived in Tamina for less than two years, and there were three of us in the competition, but I came in second, so it wasn't so bad, <laughs> Tonight, I'm here, really, to follow up on um, Bishop's perfect introduction to how is it that we share that joy that's deep, deep down inside of us. How is it that we share that gift of joy that was given to us in baptism? Because indeed, it was in baptism that we were anointed and we were invited to share in the priestly, prophetic, and kingly mission of Jesus Christ. Every one of us, by virtue of receiving the grace of the Holy Spirit, we share in Jesus' priestly ministry by being called to holiness, and we share in his prophetic ministry by being witnesses to the good news, and we share in his kingly ministry by helping to build the church of God. So the first piece of good news to share tonight is that we've all been given the grace of this mission. And the second piece of the good news is that every one of us is qualified by the virtue of baptism. So can the church say amen to that? Amen. We also know that we live in a really critical time in the life of the American church. We live in a culture and in communities in which the faith and the practice of the faith are far less a priority for people. For many of us, we don't have to look further than our families or our good friends or our co-workers. Do you know that in a recent study of practicing Catholics, people who identify themselves as practicing Catholics, they said that they go to church on average once a month. That, for them, constituted a practicing Catholic. Even those of us who are called to practice the faith and want to be a part of a church don't necessarily always make it a priority. And just this past summer, I had an experience in my neighborhood that really taught me how critical it is that we talk about what it means to be a missionary disciple. Now, I live on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., and it might come as a shock complete shock that people actually go to church on Capitol Hill. <laughs> in fact, there are three very active Catholic churches within 10 blocks of the Capitol. And there are Episcopal churches and Methodist churches and Baptist churches and single churches nestled throughout our neighborhood. So I know a lot of people in my neighborhood who go to church. I know a lot of people who don't go to church. And I spend a lot of time talking to people about evangelization about evangelization to inactive Catholics, about evangelization to people who may have been away from the faith for a long time. But I wasn't prepared for this kind of conversation. So I was walking home from the farmer's market and there were a group of four adults walking in front of me. And we were walking by an Episcopal church, a beautiful old stone church with stained glass windows. And a woman in this group in front of me said, is that building a church? So it kind of made me perk up because I thought, well, what do you think it is? And the man who she was with said, yes, it is. And she said in just this tone, do people go there? Just like that. And the man said, yes, and you know what? Even sometimes I see young people standing out in front of it. And I thought to myself, you know, she lives in a world, it seems, where it's not regular or normal or ordinary that people go to church on Sunday. She wasn't even assuming that that building that looked like a church actually functioned as a church. And this is the world we live in that we're called to bring Christ to the world. 
so that those people who don't know how we encounter Christ inside the walls of the church can have an experience of we who bring Christ first to them. It seems that we can no longer expect that because we have a church building and a sign out front and perhaps a website that people know what they'll find. It seems we live in a time that the tremendous gift that's waiting for them inside our beautiful sanctuaries is not something they even know is there. Pope Benedict XVI wrote a beautiful reflection on the tradition of um, having tabernacles within our sanctuaries and having lights and having chapels where people can come and visit the Lord. And he said from the time that he was a little boy, he always thought about that tabernacle as Jesus saying to us that he's wait he sees us walk by and he's waiting and hoping we're going to come in and make a visit. I think we live in a world that people aren't quite sure or know that when they walk into our communities, they have an encounter with the risen Christ, with the Jesus who lives among the communities. And so when we talk about sharing the joy of the gospel, we're talking about how it is that we bear Christ to the world. Pope Francis, in his exhortation, picked up on this conversation that was really begun by Pope Paul VI who said at the end of the Second Vatican Council that the work that they were doing was helping the church to be more missionary in the modern world. That in, um, in following Paul VI, we had um, John Paul II and Pope Benedict and Pope Francis who keep reminding us and keep hitting home the theme of what it means to be missionary, what it means to be intentional disciples for Jesus, about being followers of Jesus, about people who point the way toward Jesus. That's what it means to be a missionary disciple. I want to focus on the second part, disciple, because I think you're blessed here with a church who is very aware of what it means to be missionary. There's a deep sense of the missionary experience in this church, beginning with the Jesuits who first came to the state, beginning with the story of Father Levesseur, who founded the Shrine of St. Therese to bring a little bit of home with him, to the OMIs who are here, to our Korean missionary priests who are here. And so we know what it means to be missionary, and we know, we know the fruit that comes from that spirit of mission. But tonight I want to focus on the disciple part, and particularly, what does it mean to be a Catholic disciple who evangelizes? Now, evangelization has been a word that's been connected with the church as long as we preach the good news. It comes from the Greek, evangelii, which means good news. But to the American ear, when we hear evangelization, it sometimes makes us nervous. Because I think for many of us, what we first hear is evangelical. And we begin to think of sometimes the most uninviting experiences we may have had of evangelical brothers and sisters. And we say, that is not for me. The first lecture I did on evangelization back in the mid-80s, at the end of it, a woman said to me, I don't like this idea at all. She said, because I became a Catholic, so I wouldn't have to evangelize. <laughs> I said, well, I got bad news for you. <laughs> we need to do it. But there's a way in which Catholics do it that I think comes as Bishop Belisario said, right from this great joy that we have to share. And the good news is that we know it's not us who do the converting, but the Holy Spirit. And so our job is to invite, and our job is to introduce people to the Jesus that has become the joy of our lives. And it's the work of the Holy Spirit through the sacraments and through prayer that helps people to come to conversion. And so I have five, four, five um, aspects, charisms of Catholic evangelization that I think are going to be woven out all of the work that we do this weekend. Because we can agree that Catholics are an evangelizing church. We wouldn't be 2,000 years old or have a billion members if we didn't evangelize, if we didn't share the good news. 
But Pope Francis is helping us understand that in some ways, a new century calls for a new way to share the eternal truth and the beauty of the gospel. And the person we look to to teach us how to evangelize is Mary. We call Mary the perfect disciple, and rather than thinking about all the ways we're not like Mary, tonight we're going to reflect on the ways in which we can imitate Mary. Mary who is star of evangelization. Mary who is the patroness in Our Lady of the Snows of Alaska. And one of the most ancient titles for Mary is Christ Bearer. And on the holy cards for this conference, you see that so clearly. Right? You see, first and foremost, the first place your eye is drawn is to the Christ child, who she's holding in her arms. On the handout that I have for you, I have an ancient icon, one of the first um, icons to be reproduced, that shows Mary's fingers pointing to the Christ child. It was the icon to celebrate this idea of Christ bearer, or this idea that, like Mary, we're to point the way to Christ for those people that we encounter. And so being Christ bearers is absolutely at the heart of what it means to be a missionary disciple. Pope Francis wrote this in his prayer, asking the intercession of Mary at the end of the joy of the gospel. Rimming over with joy, you sang of the great things done by God. Standing at the foot of the cross with unyielding faith, you received the joyful comfort of the resurrection and joined the disciples in awaiting the Spirit so that an evangelizing church might be born. Today, in this place, we are the evangelizing church. We are the people called to point others to Jesus Christ. And so how do we do that? The first thing we do is we realize that in fact we have been called. All of us who have been baptized have been called. Pope Francis, in picking up on the Gospel of Matthew, says this, by virtue of our baptism, all the members of God have become missionary disciples. All the baptized, whatever their position in the church, whatever their level of instruction in the faith, are agents of evangelization. We, particularly as lay people, need to realize that we are agents of evangelization. If it were only the work of priests and deacons and religious sisters and religious brothers, where would we be right now in the church? We know that we have to complement the great work done by our bishops and our priests and our brothers and our sisters by being able to take the gospel to every place where there's people who are yearning to know Jesus better. The fathers of the Second Vatican Council knew that they had to renew this sense of laity having a mission if they were going to be able to preach and teach in the modern world. And so we've been blessed with an abundance of people who have shown us the way of what it means to be Christ-bearers and what it means to be evangelizers and for the last 30 years, we've talked a lot about this universal call to holiness and this baptismal vocation. And so can we say amen that we are Christ bearers and we can point people to Christ and to the church? Amen. 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 Which means, if we can say that, it means that we're convicted. And we need to be convicted. All of us know what it's like to listen to someone who's telling us something and we sit there wondering if they really believe what they're saying. Right? We've had that experience. And we know that it's not a good one because we want teachers who are witnesses. Paul VI famously said that people will believe a witness before they believe a teacher. And the only way to believe a teacher is if they are a witness. And what he's saying is, we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. We have to live like we believe what we're saying. I think Mary, again, shows us what that means. We saw that she made that yes to the angel, when the angel asked her to bear Christ to the world. 
But she wasn't convicted of that yes, I would have to say, until she made that trip to visit her cousin Elizabeth. And until she and Elizabeth had this glorious moment where the children in their wombs, the last of the great prophets, John, and the fulfillment of God's promise, Jesus, left in their wombs. And what was Mary's response? Mary's response was to break out in song. Mary said, my soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. And so this calls us, and this asks us tonight to say, is it true that we live and we move and we are grounded in the love of the Lord? That when we pray in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, that is in fact our source of our greatest joy. Can't we say that like Mary, what brings us to Mass on Sunday what makes us join the choir or Bible study or prayer group, what makes prayer a daily priority for us, is that we have found in Jesus and in the Eucharist our greatest joy. My sister lives in Manhattan, and when her two sons were in grade school, they, they walked about 10 blocks to go to grade school. And so sometimes bringing them home at the end of the day, she said, could take hours because they got distracted by everything by the people selling pretzels on the corner, by the shops. And so one day, they were like on a mission, they had to get home, and so she was really trying to keep them focused. And she saw the woman with her stand of pamphlets, and she thought, oh gosh, the boys are gonna wanna take a pamphlet, and then the woman's gonna wanna talk to them. So she was trying to corral them, so hopefully they wouldn't see the stand. And the woman said, you've got two beautiful boys, do they know Jesus? <laughs> she was thinking, okay. And her son, Andrew, said, Oh yeah, we talk about Jesus every day in school. And the woman said, that's beautiful, and do you know how great it is that we know Jesus? And her other son, Sean, said, well, you know, it wasn't really so great, because he died. <laughs> so, Leslie thought, well, on the one hand, I've got a young evangelizer, on the other hand, we've got a little bit more work to do at home. But are we convicted enough that we're not afraid to say, to a family member, or a co-worker, or a friend, I have found in Jesus my greatest joy. Are we not able to say, come and see what I have found, that in Jesus, and in the sacraments, and in the life of the church, I have found a resource that helps me to answer the biggest questions that I have in life. But even more importantly, in Jesus, I've experienced what love really is. And that's the source of my joy. And so Catholic evangelizers are called and we're convicted. And if we do it well, we're contagious. Pope Francis, drawing on soon to be Pope Paul VI's point, teaches that the church which goes forth is a community of missionary disciples who take the first step and are involved and supportive and bear fruit and rejoice. He said, let us recover and deepen our enthusiasm that the delightful and comforting joy of evangelizing, even when it's in tears that we must sow, be for our world in our time, which is sometimes searching with anguish sometimes looking for hope, let us enable them to receive the news from evangelizers who are not dejected, who are not discouraged, who are not impatient or anxious, but from the ministers of, as of, from the, ministers of the gospel whose lives glow with fervor, who have first received the joy of Christ. This is such an important message for we who may find ourselves really dejected these days in, in the church and in some of the church's leaders. But for us to be able to say that dejection can be turned in joy, to joy, to, in the extent that we can trust our love of Jesus. 
When I was reading this over with my husband, he said, I'm not sure about the word contagious. It doesn't really have very good connotations. He said, people tend to stay away from things that are contagious. And because one should always listen to their spouse, I thought, well, I'll Google contagious, but I've got my C thing going here, and so I need to keep a C word. And so as I was reading the definition of contagious, I thought, you know what? This is exactly what Pope Francis is talking about. He wants us to be infectious. He wants us to be able to infect others with the joy of the gospel. And you know, we live in a world where people are desperate to be happy. We live in a world where people are desperate to find peace. That they're longing for a sense of security that is deep-seated and not fleeting. And we are Christ bearers. And we have the opportunity to say, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the future. Don't be afraid of trusting in Jesus. Don't be afraid of reaching out and ask Jesus to heal you, or to listen to you, or to help you. We can say to people in our own way, in whichever words match our experience, what we have found in Jesus. And I think people find that contagious. I'm sure that you have probably had a similar experience, but I work a lot in my parish with RCIA. And we have a lot of young people who come explore the RCIA program because they've come to work on the Hill. And for many of them, it's the first time they're kind of facing big and serious questions and thinking about it in terms of, of their faith, either the faith they were raised in or maybe thinking about it in a way that they don't feel like they have the right um, language or the right content to do that. And so I always like to ask them what made them decide to explore the Catholic faith. And one time a young woman said to me that she'd been going through a really hard time. She had lost a parent. She had a really difficult situation at work that had gotten very ugly, and she saw people behave in a way that she didn't think that adults behaved. She was having a hard time making friends because she was new to the area. And so she said she started thinking about the people that she knew and the people she worked with and who were the ones that seemed to have it together, she said. Who were the ones that seemed to be able to face these things going on in a way that she felt like she couldn't. And so when she thought about who those people were, she realized what they all had in common were that they were Catholic. And so she started walking in the neighborhood to find the first Catholic church. And she wrote down the phone number and she called and asked if they had in, uh, classes to learn what it means to be Catholic. Now I would have to say it's unusual in this day and age, right, that someone just writes down the phone number on the sign out front and asks. But what was so interesting to me was she didn't talk to any of those Catholics to ask them about what was it their faith that made them act in a way that she found so compelling. But she thought it must be that, because that's what they had in common. I think we don't realize sometimes that what we have is so attractive to others. I think we don't realize sometimes what it looks like to have a genuine sense of hope, or what it looks like to be able to say, hey, I'll pray for you, and mean that or to ask other people to pray for us and know that they will. And so I think that for many of us, it's not that we have to learn something new. It just is that we have to take the opportunity when we can share the source of what we have found that's working for us in life. Other people are actually really interested. And so I feel like weekends like this and all of this work that we're doing as a church to reflect on what it means to be missionary disciples is to recommit ourselves in our efforts to say yes in a more intentional way to be missionary. This is at the heart of where we know we need to grow in order for people not to walk by the church and even wonder if there's something inside that they might want that they might want to experience. And so if we're convicted and contagious, we know it really means that we have to be courageous. 
because it really isn't easy work. I find it much easier to talk in a situation like this in front of a large group of people than I do to sit down with my nieces and nephews who are wondering if they should move in with their boyfriend or girlfriend, who are wondering if it makes a difference if they get married in the church and have that hard, long conversation about why it makes a difference. It's not always easy once we leave the community we've built up in our parishes or our prayer groups or our Bible studies. But you know what? It was Jesus who first said, go and baptize. And it's Pope Benedict and Pope Francis who have said in really different ways, we have to open up wide the doors to Christ. We have to leave the church boundaries and go out into the community so we can invite people to come and to see. And this takes courage, especially today. A lot of people don't think they need what the church has to offer. A lot of people feel like, while they may want a spiritual life, they don't want it connected to a church or to an institution. A lot of people think that they can do it on their own, and some people just aren't thinking about it at all. And so to have those conversations takes a tremendous amount of courage. But Pope Francis says this, we need to remind ourselves that it's the Lord who has taken the initiative. It's the Lord who has loved us first. And so we can go boldly, and we can take the initiative, and we can seek others out. And I would have to say that there's a way in which we can also wait till the opportunity arises. But I feel like that we'll have responsibility if we let that opportunity pass and we haven't started the conversation. Because the great thing we have going for us is Jesus just expects us to start it. We're not going to be tested on whether people have come to Christ or whether people have stopped into church when we've invited them to do that. We're only going to be asked about the, about the people with whom we first shared the conversation or about the times when we thought someone might be ready, we were willing to talk with them about the great joy that we have found. And so the courage really comes in just being able to be free to share what it is that we've learned in our walk with Jesus, in the way that he touched our lives and in our own language. And above all, if we're not ready to have the conversation, we can certainly begin by praying for people. Right? That may be the only thing we can do in a situation, but also the most powerful. That we can always pray for someone and they don't even need to know that we're doing that. And so the other thing that Pope Francis says in such a direct way and what he challenges us to do if we want to keep growing as missionary disciples is to leave our comfort zone. And so one of the questions I think we may need to reflect on this weekend is what is our comfort zone? And what would it mean to take one or two steps outside of that comfort zone? I invite you to ask yourself over the course of the weekend, where, what would it look like for me to go one or two steps outside that comfort zone? And where would it take me? And when I get there, what would I have to say about the love of Jesus? And what would I have to share in this situation? And so to be convicted and courageous and contagious invites us to say yes to being a missionary disciple. And so what I want to give you a chance to do is just turn to the person beside you and to share which do you think comes most easily of these C's and which do you think would take you out of your comfort zone? So just take a minute to share. Is it courage? Is it conviction? Is it contagion? What is it? Where do you feel most comfortable? And where do you need to grow a little? Okay. We'll have lots 
lots more time in the course of the weekend to continue our conversation. But I think what we can do is we can certainly ask Mary's intercession for those areas that we need to be strengthened, um, that we need to find um, the, the source of our strength in her. And so what I would like to do is have us end by reading the prayer for, um, for this gathering. And you should have a copy of it in your folders. It's a beautiful image. Of Mary, star of the sea, holding the Christ child. And so knowing that Mary was the first and the most perfect of the missionary disciples, we can seek and ask her intercession, that we too can be like her and point others to Christ. As we pray together, Mary, Virgin and Mother, you who move by the Holy Spirit, welcome the word of life in the depths of your humble faith. As you gave yourself completely to the Eternal One, help us to say our own yes to the urgent call, as pressing as ever, to proclaim the good news of Jesus, star of the evangelization. Help us to bear radiant witness to communion, service, Honor and generous faith, justice and love of the poor, that the joy of the gospel may reach the ends of the earth, illuminating even the fringes of our world. Mother of the living gospel, wellspring of happiness for God's little ones.